Okay, well, good morning, everyone in the UK. Good afternoon, everyone in China, and good day, everyone in between. And welcome to our session this morning on localizing for ch uh, Chinese consumers who, where, and what in the F and B sector. Delighted to have Mark Tanner, uh, the founder and managing director of China Skinny, with us today. If you're not signed up to Mark's well-known China Skinny blog and newsletter that pops out, go, do go to China Skinny's website and sign up for it. It's a, it's a fascinating insight on all sorts of um, trends and patterns and, and such like in, in the China market. So, so I would certainly advise that. Um, the food market in China is obviously enormous. It's already the world's largest grocery market at about a trillion pounds. And this year is destined to become the world's largest market for imported F&B um, uh, products. So that's exciting news, exciting news for everybody joining today and, and great opportunities. But like everything, not without challenges, not without uh, nuances and subtleties in the market that you need to understand. And hopefully today we'll discuss a few of those. So just before we get going, a little bit of background for those of you who may not know us. Uh, the China Britain Business Council helps British and Chinese businesses and organizations work together in China, the UK and third markets around the world. With 60 years of experience, experts across the UK and in 15 Chinese locations and a diverse 1,000 strong membership, we operate alongside the British Chamber of Commerce in China to support companies of all sizes and sectors from multinationals to SMEs. As the partner of choice with British companies working with China, CBC delivers a range of events, tailored research and consultative services. We operate closely with the Department for International Trade, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and across government to highlight export opportunities for UK companies and investment opportunities for Chinese organizations. So that's just a little bit of background on us. I do hope that today will be an interactive session. So please do feel free to ask questions. The way you do so is just type your question in and then it pops up on my screen. If it's pertinent to what uh, Mark is talking about at the time, I'll, I'll ask it immediately. Otherwise, we'll save it to a Q&A session at the end. If I could ask now people to click on the raise your hand button, that's just to make sure that uh, our connection is okay, then I don't feel like I'm speaking out into the ether uh, in, a, in a lonely way. So just make sure, let me just make sure that people are doing that. If you could click on the raise here, yep, lots of hands going up there. Super, thanks very much. That means I can be heard. So you know, we will record this session. And if you have a colleague or a friend or such like that you think should have attended today, we'll make that recording available. All right, uh, now on to our topic for today. So. Mark Tanner is the founder and managing director of China Skinny. He brings perspective from marketing roles in China, North America, Europe, Australasia and Africa, where he has worked since the 90s. Mark regularly provides views and commentary about Chinese consumers in media, such as Bloomberg and Reuters and on television. He's a regular keynote speaker at events from Shanghai to Sydney and Hong Kong to Helsinki. On a personal front, Mark has a love for travel and adventure, which has seen him lead, for, uh, lead the world's first paddle down the Nile River, hunt for ancient Viking treasure in Iceland, and bicycle solo across Canada uh, in midwinter. Well, that's uh, quite a fascinating background. So let me just make sure that Mark is still there. Let me get you online. Give me a second, Mark. There you are. Okay, can you hear us, Mark? Yeah, yeah, everything's pretty clear here. Okay, super. Well, over to you. Great. Well, yeah, just a, a little bit of background. China Skinny has worked with over 150 brands, um, and food and beverage is our biggest category. Uh, we've worked across uh, over 24, well, 24 industries. So we bring perspective from, from all these different industries, which in many cases will apply to food and beverage. So. For today, I'm mainly going to talk about food and beverage, but there are some more general China stats that I'll throw in there, which I think are relevant and hopefully of interest. So we can we can kick off uh, with with the first slide, David. Yeah, so here's some research we did in tier one and tier two cities with consumers uh, related to an Australian food and beverage brand, and they were obviously. In Australia, they wanted to rebrand and, and make sure that their brand was relevant to uh, the Chinese consumers as well, which was their largest export market. So part of the branding, obviously branding is, is much deeper than, than just a few pretty pictures and colors and things, but part of the, the research involved uh, looking at what imagery really reflects and sings out Australia for, uh, for Chinese consumers. 
And so we looked at some of those most famous icons and, and we said, which, which ones of these really, really do resonate and really do sing out Australia. Interestingly, we have about four clients that, that have the, uh, the, uh, the map of Australia as their logo. That you know, was very unrecognizable. There were very few Chinese consumers that, that knew what that actually was. The flag is similar. Um, the Union Jack does incredibly well and, and the Star Spangled Banner and, and the German flag, surprisingly. But the Australian flag just had very little uh, awareness and resonance there as well. Boomerang was surprisingly high. Uh, most people knew what a boomerang was, but they didn't get good feelings about it. They didn't feel warm and fuzzy inside, which, which you really want with your brand. Um, and, and they saw it as a weapon. And we've done similar research with, with a number of Australian tourist uh, regional operators and, and, and other attractions. And similarly, they don't really uh, bode too well the Aboriginal culture with, with uh, Chinese consumers, whereas some of the other indigenous cultures are much more resonant. But overwhelmingly, and, and as I'm sure most of you probably would have picked, it's that kangaroo and that koala that really did resonate. And, and, and you just need to go into an office, a white collar office in China in a, in a sophisticated city, and you'll see a bunch of 30 year old women all with uh, Hello Kitty knits and, and little uh, cute fuzzy things on their desk. They love the cutesy animals. So, some and you're seeing it in, in food and beverage and everything from tourism, airplanes to uh, smartphone advertisements. They do love cute furry animals. So it was really good for for this brand that the kangaroo did did resonate well in the koala and in some of the lower tier cities. But something more interesting was the colours and. Uh, if you want to yeah, get the colours up. So we, we talked to these consumers and we said, which of these colours most represent uh, Australia to you? So do you want to throw up the poll, David, and we'll ask, ask you guys just to, sure, just to sure. get your views. And so we're, we're going to ask all of you uh, what you think. Uh, uh, what, what of these colours do you think the Chinese uh, most associated with Australia. Just while we're doing that, uh, Mark, how did you uh, how did you conduct this sort of research? Is it by um, you know focus groups, or were you calling them up on the phone, or, or how are you getting that content? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, David. So we typically look to localize research, and, and everyone talks about localizing for China, and then they'll roll out the same research methodologies that they use in other markets. And we've found things like focus groups can be quite challenging. We do have some some clients insist on them and, and in some cases they're great. But you have the issue of face in China. So if you're talking to, to a consumer, they may lose face if they give the wrong answer or may someone else in the group may lose face. So we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, research for face-to-face, -face, which this in this case it was. But something we're doing more and more of is, is WeChat research. And we've found that, that Chinese are very forthcoming with, with information on WeChat. And it can be very complementary to some of the other research we're doing. So in this case, it was face to face, but uh, yeah, we, we, we use a number of localized methods. Well, here's the results of, of our group. Uh, they think 22% blue, 4% red, 13% green, and 61% yellow. Do you want to uh, shed some light it's, on what you're doing? It's a head, head, head messer when I, when I say blue and there's a pink line, but um, now that's a really common result, particularly for Commonwealth countries. I mean, obviously, we, we all, I'm from New Zealand, so we have quite a strong sports rivalry with, with the Australians, much like you guys. Anyone who's watched an Ashes cricket match would probably pick yellow. So, yeah. um, and interestingly, Americans, and, and we speak to a lot of Americans, they all say blue. Uh, Germans, Europeans say red with, with the red rocks, the Uluru in the middle of the country, and, and the actual translation in German for Australia's Greek continent. Hmm. But funnily enough, the smallest or the lowest there was green and that was almost unanimous uh, with Chinese consumers that they associate Australia with green. And as a Kiwi, I, I struggle with that. I, I really don't understand how they see it as green, but uh, they, they do see it as green, pure and natural, which is obviously great for their food and beverage brands. So I guess the moral well, guess, story there, Mark, is that uh, what you think they think is probably wrong, that you need, you need to get a, a better understanding on the ground of, of what the reality of the understanding of your product, service, or, or indeed country is. 
I couldn't have put it better myself, Dave. Yeah, I guess it's, there's all these assumptions we have, and even myself have been here a number of years now, and, and we're constantly living, breathing China. There's very few projects we do that I'm not surprised by the results, because that just consumers here are wired so differently from us in the West. So we could go on to the next slide. And it's moving across the Pacific uh, from Australia, so we're taking on a little world tour here, to the US. And I think uh, I used to live in, in North America and have very fond memories of the place. But something I found really interesting was uh, just the way they live their lives. They all work incredibly hard. They study, and they go to university, and a certain demographic will get their masters and then go work for the man for, for many years, saving up hard for their kids' college fund. And then come around 50 or so, they all of a sudden have this midlife crisis and go buy themselves a Harley Davidson or, or a Porsche in this case. Now, if you look at the average age of a Porsche owner in America, it is 52 years old. Um, that baby boomer market, it's, it's, it's the most prosperous market in America and, and New Zealand and, and, and UK and many other places. A lot of these consumers with, with a lot of home equity and things. But if you look across uh, the Pacific into China, the average Porsche owner is just 35 years old. So there's a significantly different demographic that are, that are buying these luxury high-end goods and, and just buying product um, spending like unlike any other generation in China. And that's these millennials that, that everyone's talking about. And I'm sure most of you have heard it before, but it's really interesting to kind of see what's why it's happening and why they're spending. So the next slide um, really covers why that is. So if you look at consumers or, or Chinese, and what you look at people in most countries in the world, and that's on the left hand side, you'll see USA's income. Unfortunately, I don't have UK, but the UK, much like most countries, is very similar to to the rest of the world, that the older you are, you, normally the more you earn. Um, so you get more experience, you get a higher paying job. And then that's, sorry, it's really, really small, but that last little dip at the end is when you hit 55 and you really don't know about things like social media and e-commerce and, and all these new wacky things that everyone's using these days and become a little bit irrelevant. But that's typically how most things work. If you look in China, it is back to front. So the highest earning income group, that left bar is 28, sorry, 18 to 29. The next is 30 to 45, and then it drops significantly after 45. So quite unusual and, and with good reason. If you go into a village in China, I don't know how many of you have, if you go into a village in China, it's quite a strange demographic. So you have a lot of kids running around, a lot of old people, there's this gaping hole that, that anyone is, is of that kind of young working age is uh, living in the cities. Um, go on, move to the big town to, uh, to find their fortune. And typically, in, in, well, on average, in the city, you earn more than three times as much as the countryside. So these young people are much more likely to be in the cities earning more. They're also much more likely to be better educated. So the average person born in the 90s in China is more than three times, to seven times more likely to have a university degree than someone born in the 70s. So they're more educated, they're earning more, but they're also more open. Um, so that's obviously very relevant for imported food and beverage products. They're more open to foreign lifestyles and products and things. Um, and if you look at this Pew, this is not China Skinny Research, but Pew do a lot of soft power work around the world. And they've, this, I apologize, this was before Trump, so things have probably changed quite a lot. But if you look overall, those under 35, 60% um, of them view America in a positive light. And by proxy, the, the West. So if you look at the older, the over 50s, just over a third view America positively. So they're much grumpier, much more nationalistic, much um, more closed minded. Those, uh, those older people, much like uh, consumers around the world, it's the millennials that are most liberal and most open-minded. And another thing that contributes to that is traveling. And you look at two thirds of China's international travelers are 
over 30 or under 35. So we, China Skinny does a lot of research into, um, I guess, affinities between categories and some work uh, we're, we're looking at with Tourism Australia was, was how uh, Chinese view Australian food and beverage. And in general, it's 27%, whereas those that have visited Australia, it goes up to 69%. So significant um, increase in, in preference. Similarly, uh, it wasn't our research, but there was another research that found Chinese that that moved, visited Australia when they returned, they were spent 60% more on average on Australian uh, products. A lot of that being food and beverage, and that's no surprise. I'm sure those of you that have come to China when you return to the UK, you're probably much more likely to buy dumplings and Sichuan pepper and all these. Uh, specialties that, that you find in this country. So, and we've done similar research with uh, the Nordic countries and found consumers that travelled to these countries also had uh, affinities with uh, Scandinavian design, fashion, furniture, uh, food and beverage. So, there's a lot of a lot of the, the the positives come out of tourism, and these are the guys that are travelling the most. Um, yeah, if you want to. So the way we, we segment consumers in the West, the Gen X, the Gen Y, I'm sure anyone who's had much to do with China would, would be familiar with the term post 80s, post 90s. These are the most common segment, segmentations for Chinese consumers. But it's worth noting that the two are quite different. And China Skinny, we do a lot of research in a lot of different places and we do find that even in a city like Shanghai, there are all sorts of different consumer groups and, and it's, they're not just one generic uh, group of people born in the 80s, but there are some very consistent characteristics we see. And if you look at post 80s, these consumers have grown up in a China that wasn't always wealthy. Uh, it wasn't the big shiny towers and the, the, the great world power that they have today. So they've seen China become what it is today. And as a result, they believe that China dream. They drink the Kool-Aid. So they, they are very conforming in a way. Um, they, they act the way they consume, the way they behave, is the kind of thing that Beijing probably quite likes. Uh, they, can, they, uh, they buy brands that most other people are buying, they buy products that most other people are buying. It's just the way they are. But fast forward 10 years later, post 90s, these guys were born, they've only ever known a very wealthy and powerful China are born with a smartphone in their hand, digital natives, and they uh, they don't quite buy into the China dream in the way that, that older generations do. So a lot of them work incredibly hard. Um, they study for the, for the Galco exam, which is incredibly tough, or a lot of them will skip it and go study overseas or study overseas after. And they work very hard, spend a lot of money in, in, in studying, and then they'll return to China which is happening more and more now. And they'll be lucky if they're making a thousand dollars a month or or six hundred pounds a month. Um, and, and they're like, what's this China dream all about? Of of the kids I was studying with in the UK are making ten times that. Why why am I not earning if China's so powerful? So as a result, they don't quite buy into that dream. But at the same time, they're very proud of where China is now and where it's come from and and, and those beautiful Chinese traditions are still very important to them. But something you see in their behavior is, is they're much less likely to conform. It's almost the way they build their status, their street cred is, is to do things a little off, off center, so a little less mainstream. So you're seeing all the rise of all these brands that are less uh, known, more niche, more independent, more edgy see the way they travel on holiday they're not just about getting the selfie in front of the big bean they want to do more uh, more uh, less mainstream things and, and go to more exotic places and, and do different types of things when they're there and you see it in their social media feeds from the products they're showing off to where they go on holiday um, but the, the interesting thing about these consumers is they relate more to their peers overseas similar age consumers overseas than older generations in china but it's kind of important to remember that but something that is quite common with both of these consumers is they haven't 
growing up through the austere times that the older generations did. So they are not, uh, don't have that inherent need to save quite in the way that, that older generations do, that Chinese are very famous for. In fact, they are spending more and borrowing more to, to fund that spending than ever has they ever have in China. If you look at consumer credit, it's growing fivefold between 2015 to 2017. So phenomenal growth, unprecedented in the world. And 75% of that consumer credit has come from consumers aged 24 to 35. So it's these guys that are, are both spending it more than anyone else, but they're, uh, they're borrowing to, uh, to fund it. And if you look at why they are a little more liberal with the way they're spending, um, you only need to look in a city like Shanghai, which has, it's a city of 25 million people, there are only actually 11 million Shanghainese people. So they have what's called a hukou, which is kind of like a passport. If you don't have a, a hukou, or if you're not Shanghainese, you won't have the same rights and privileges. You won't have the same access to education, health, to buying houses in the way that, that Shanghainese people do. So if you look at these 11 million people, their households, they own all of the houses in China, oh, sorry, in Shanghai for, uh, for the city of 25 million. So on average, it's about two houses per household. So that's average. So there's an awful lot of Chinese or Shanghainese that own four, five or six houses, uh, all on average worth about over a million dollars each. So not unusual for mum and dad to own six houses worth six million dollars. And also my two sets of grandparents uh, may do the same. So between them, they own six houses each. So that's $12 million plus mum and dad. That's $18 million worth of property that as the only child I'm the sole heir to. Similarly, uh, the way it works in Shanghai, Shanghainese are much more likely to marry other people from Shanghai. Uh, and it's typically done on a similar socioeconomic group. So you're you're going to marry someone else whose parents may own and grandparents may own $18 million worth of property. So between them, a married couple, a young married couple stands to inherit uh, $36 million. And that's not unusual. That's worth the property. So as a result, if you are earning $1,000 a month, it's not really going to mean that much to you when you stand to inherit millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of property. And that's not the extreme, that is actually quite normal. Similarly in Beijing and, and a lot of the other bigger cities, in the tier two cities, even right down to tier five cities, there's been quite phenomenal property uh, appreciation. So you're getting a lot of equity. And, and so these guys are spending up a storm and, and they have a lot less worries than, than the older generations and a lot more equity to, to play on. Uh, do you want to flex uh, slides there? Now, something else worth noting is, is just how many cities there are in China. I've spoken of Shanghai and Beijing, and, and you see most brands that come in here, um, that's, that's where they'll typically come to. And, and in many cases, it's, they are the most sophisticated consumers in China. They have the highest spending power, um, but they're also incredibly um, contested and very crowded. If you look at a city like Shanghai, um, the average consumer is bombarded with four times as much advertising as, as, a, as a consumer in the UK. Um, if you look just in, there's 150 new grocery launches in China, and a large share of them come into Shanghai every single day. So 150 grocery launches a day, plus you had wealth management products, you had tourism products, new apps, new restaurant openings, all these new things. There's over 500 brands every single day, uh, all, all singing out, trying to get the attention of these consumers. And so in many cases, some of these lower tier cities are, are much less contended and, and also contested, sorry, and also more likely to uh, appreciate foreign brands just because they're not bombarded in the way that consumers in Shanghai and Beijing are. But it's also worth noting that, that 
even if, if you do come into these tier one cities, the Shanghai, Beijing's of the world, they are quite different from one another. So you might get brands that are localizing for China, but they just have a homogenous strategy um, to, to really localize. And that's better than nothing. But in many cases, consumers in a city like Beijing are quite different from a city like Shanghai. For example, um, there's the weather. Um, weather leads to different lifestyles, different tastes. Uh, if you're selling skincare in Beijing, uh, the weather is incredibly dry uh, or, or it's incredibly hot or incredibly cold in the winter, very polluted. Whereas skincare down in the south and the two other tier one cities, uh, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, it's uh, subtropical and it's not as polluted, so you have different needs for skincare. Food tastes are incredibly different from region to region. Uh, if you look at China's very well known in the north, they love uh, the wheat and base products, so the dumplings, the noodles. In the south, it's very rice based. Out west, it's very spicy, so you have these different food tastes. But from an emotional standpoint, they're, they're very different as well. So if you look at Beijing, um, the types of messages we find that resonate from, from China Skinny Research is, is uh, nationalistic and they're much more nationalistic, much more likely to buy a Chinese car up there. Um, they are um, much more family bonding really resonates up there. Now the men are quite well known to be very macho, but if you move uh, south to Shanghai, the, the men are, are known to carry their partner's handbags. Um, they do a lot of the cooking and cleaning. So if you're looking at food and beverage, uh, whilst it's mainly women preparing in, in Beijing in the north, in a city like Shanghai, there's a lot of men that could be your potential target market. Similarly, messaging that is aspirational, quite creative, quite international, uh, do a lot better in, in Shanghai than Beijing. And if you go down south to the other tier one cities, you've got uh, Shenzhen and Guangzhou, a 30 minute train ride apart. And a lot, of con a lot of brands will come in and lump those two together. But they're incredibly different. And, and if you, you only need to look at the spoken language in the two cities. So if you look at Guang Guangzhou, it's quite an old city. And so most of the people, more than half the population is, is Guangzhouese. So they, they have, uh, Cantonese as their, as their native language. Um, they, they, much like in Shanghai, they're the ones with the hukos, so they, they speak Cantonese. Whereas just down the tracks in Shenzhen, it's a migrant city. So up until 35 years ago, it was a fishing village and people have come from all over China uh, to, to seek their fortune. So you've got the common spoken language as uh, Mandarin. So two cities very close together two quite different languages. Uh, similarly, from, a, from an emotional messaging point of view, which is I think getting more and more important as, as consumers are, are tending more towards brands and those emotional buttons. Uh, you look at it, people in Guangzhou, because they're from there, a lot of them live with, particularly these millennials, live with their parents or live very close to their parents. So they'll see their parents every night, if not once a week. Down the tracks in Shenzhen, because it's a migrant city, people don't live with their parents. So they will, uh, in many cases, may only see them once a year when they return home for Chinese New Year. They may only see them a few times a year. So when you're kind of connecting over that family bonding type messaging, it can be quite different between those two cities. So something worth considering uh, when you are localizing. And if you look at a city like Shanghai, 25 million people here, so more, more people than Australia. The economy is, is or the GDP is larger than the UAE. Uh, the, by some measures, the purchase power parity is, is up there with Switzerland. So you've got an incredibly wealthy uh, population with more people in a bigger economy than two pretty large markets that many food and beverage exporters will go in and localize just for those markets. So in the same vein, it's probably worth considering localizing for those specific markets here because one, as I said before, they're highly competitive. There's new products, and brands launching all the time. And so if you don't have a really resonant and personal message that just for these uh, consumers, you're less likely to really appeal to them. 
because uh, a lot of brands are, particularly the domestic brands, are really quite local specific in their messaging. There's 13 cities with, with more people than uh, China. No, sorry, with a GDP of greater than one trillion uh, RMB. So well worth localizing for some of these bigger cities because they are uh, incredibly large. If you want to flick the slide again, uh, David. Now here's a city a lot of people uh, may not be familiar with. It looks a lot like Hangzhou, but it's actually uh, further west in a, in a province called Hanhui. And this city is uh, it's called Tongling. It's it's a very small city. It's a tier five city with a with a measly 1.7 million people. So not significant at all on China's map. Uh, doesn't even get a, a dot on the weather the weather map every night. But it, but it, we went there on a team trip a couple of years ago. We went into a supermarket, and there were rows and rows of imported wines, imported whiskies, imported biscuits, breads, all these crazy products that you wouldn't have seen even in a tier two city uh, a decade ago. So you're starting to see these cities, these lower tier cities, rising in a way that's never risen before. Um, and if you look, this is not our research, but Boston Consulting uh, Group believe between 2016 and 2020, there'll be 50 million new households uh, that are in that middle to upper class, so have discretionary income to buy quality imported food. Half of them will be outside those top 100 cities. So sorry, I didn't mention it in the slide before, but. These are cities with uh, less people than New Zealand. So it's very small by uh, Chinese standards. Do you want to flip the slide again? Now, something that is incredibly interesting, and in China's going to work with about a dozen dairy brands. Being from New Zealand, I've always found the dairy category incredibly interesting. Um, but if you look at China, it's changing incredibly quickly, but and trends come and go, but something that has stayed pretty consistent throughout uh, the last decade is uh, the, the melamine scandal. So back 10 years ago, I'm sure many of you are aware, um, some local dairy brands tried to bolster their protein count by uh, adding a toxic chemical melamine. And as a result, Chinese consumers are very wary of uh, domestic products. Uh, in many cases, um, particularly in the dairy category, there's been a, a string of, um, of issues around fake goods and counterfeits and unsafe products and all sorts of scandals that have helped reinforce this. So dairy particularly is one of those categories, and we've spoken to consumers across many food and beverage categories, and every single one of them perceives imported foreign brands as as better, safer, healthier. So with that in mind, um, we use some tools here at China Skinny to, it's been a very helpful tool for us to really analyze um, different market categories. And we analyze the price per litre of, of liquid dairy products in China and found that the average for foreign brands are 11 quai 63. So around two pounds a litre. Um, Sorry, one pound, just over one pound a litre for, uh, for liquid dairy here for foreign brands. Be interesting to hear your thoughts based on that, based on that perception that foreign is better, what you think the price per litre of domestic brands for dairy is. So we've got another poll here, if you can bring that up again, David. Yeah, that's so based on Dave now. Yeah, so just to remind it, it's the, the price for imported or foreign brands is 11 quai 63. So it'd be interesting to think what you, the price point you see for uh, domestic dairy products. Uh, just while we're waiting for people to fill, fill that out, um, have you, I mean, you've talked a lot about one of the sort of overwhelming things I think about many of our companies and members approaching China is all these you know, dozens of cities, and and it, it can be quite overwhelming as to know where to start. So if somebody is going off the radar of the tier ones, for instance, and maybe going down to tier two, three, three, four, what sort of criteria would you look for if you're trying, to, you know, say you're a, a medium-sized uh, F&B company in the UK and you're looking for a market slightly off the radar, uh, what criteria would you look for in that city that might be appealing? It's a really good question, David. So we... 
we often look in, into this as, as part of the projects that we're doing and we'll evaluate uh, a number of different things from getting back to that tourism. Um, what, who, who of these, which of these cities have a high concentration of tourists going to the UK? Direct flights have more resonance. What are they searching for online? Are they searching for British products? Are they searching for British related things? Do they already have uh, a high concentration of British brands in that market? I'll also look at e-commerce, what are they buying? And that can give some really good, good insights into where demand is. But it's also worth using that as, as, a, as a benchmark for what are, the, what are the markets we should be going in offline. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a number of different ways that, that we. Uh, all right, but there's a lot. There's a lot of digital tools that that are reasonably accessible where you could look to see, you know, it could be something as simple as a, a collaboration twin city between the UK or a university collaboration that somehow builds a rapport for UK products that you could build off. Totally, totally. All right. Well, we have the results here. So 43% say five RMB. Uh, 24, 7.5, 24, 10.5, and 10%, 16. Yeah, well done to the 10%. Amazingly, and, and it really surprised us at the time that, that domestic brands are actually selling for 37% more per litre, even with all these perception advantages, which for us originally were scratching our head, thinking, why on earth is that happening? But you don't need to scratch the surface much to really realize why it's happening. And if you want to click, click to the new slide, David. Um, if you look at the way Chinese drink milk, it's typically quite different from the way we do in the West. And they're not big consumers. Um, they don't have a big uh, pour a big glass before bed or in for breakfast. They'll, they'll have much smaller portions. But they also have this concern around freshness. And they believe that once you open a pack, it's no longer fresh, even if it's UHT milk with a shelf life of nine months. Uh, the minute you cut that open, um, you're going to, it, it's not fresh. A lot of consumers will keep it in the cupboard. They like to drink milk at ambient, at room temperature. So it's quite an interesting um, study. That, and we used our tool to, to work out who's selling what formats and things. And every single foreign brand seems to come in and think it's a great idea to sell these one litre Tetra packs. And, and if you look at down the bottom there, 98% of all one litre Tetra packs are foreign brands. But you don't need to look up a little bit higher and, and you, you're looking at the domestic brands sell significantly larger share of those much smaller uh, single serve, more convenient packages that really do resonate a lot better with uh, the local brand. So format's a big thing and we see it across, dairy is the extreme, but we see it across every category we work in, almost format size and things like that, that it's, it's um, very important to get that packaging and format right uh, to, to really compete with these Chinese consumers. So obviously smaller packs, you can charge a premium, hence uh, that, that price being higher. But it's not just about the packs, if you want to flip the, flip the button again, Dave. It's also about kind of adding value, value added. Uh, and, and again, every, every foreign brand comes in and think it's a great idea to just sell them a liter of, of plain white milk. And what we're finding is Chinese love to have something a little more special. So they don't want just this generic product that would suit 1.4 billion other Chinese. They want something that's special to them. So you're seeing a lot of domestic brands come in and they're selling children specific milk. So whether, and it's not just for children, it's milk that helps kids sleep, milk that helps kids bone development, brain development, all these special little things that, that Chinese consumers are sold on, these little additives and, and vitamins and whatever else that make them feel like they're doing a better job as parents or, or uh, fitness go and millennials that go to the gym want higher protein or elderly that want dairy for their joints. All these different things that are very segment specific from both a product to a marketing, branding, positioning play. Um, they've done a much better job than the Western brands. Similarly, flavoured milk uh, dominated by the local guys. And the big one there is UHT yogurt, which is 
growing significantly faster than just standard liquid milk. But it's actually now a bigger category. Chinese just can't get enough of drinking yogurt. And, and that's something, although there's that perception that dairy is better from, from afar, um, that's something that, that foreign brands have really missed the boat on. 92% of all uh, UHT yogurt sold online uh, domestic brand. So I think that's really worth uh, highlighting just the importance of just getting back to that original um, first slide about the colors. It's these guys in China are quite different, not just from a perception, but the way they consume products, what they like. So it's important to really get that right. How are we doing for time? I know, sorry, we're, we're already um, getting quite long. Have we got? Yeah, we're okay. Time? Just uh, let's, let's, we can finish off our slides and have a quick Q and A. Yeah, people, uh, people are all still here and uh, in, engrossed in, in what you have to say. Great, do you want to flick it to the next one? Sure. So this is, my favorite, one of my favorite stories in China. And it's, it's not a very fortunate story. It happened back in 2013 in uh, the central China province of Hunan. And what had happened is the local zoo there advertised that they had a lion. And as I said right at the start, China with the kangaroos and koalas, Chinese love cute furry animals. So they were very excited that this lion was coming to their city. And people from all around the province uh, came to the zoo on, on, on opening day. And, and there were people elbowing each other, fighting for the best spot around the cage, kids dragging mum and dad and grandparents, and everyone's vying for the best position of the lion. Do you want to click it? So the lion comes out, starts barking, woof, woof, having to be a Tibetan mastiff. What that kind of highlights from a... From a a societal point of view is right from a very early age, kids going to the zoo, kids are subjected to fakes. Um, everything from, I remember a few years back in 2013, in one month there was uh, an expose into beef and lamb that was actually rat and ferret. There's talk of it, it's urban legend of fake eggs, fake rice like wine, it's a big thing here, if you, even if you're at some fancy bar in, in Shanghai or Beijing, you drop a, a hundred pounds on a bottle of wine, there's no guarantee it's, it's the real thing. It's, it's a real industry around uh, getting empty bottles and filling them up with cheap plonk. And so there's all sorts of fake issues. As a result, Chinese consumers do not trust, they don't take things at face value. Do you want to click the... Um, so I'm sure, People are familiar with uh, cross-border commerce. If you look at, uh, it's a way for a lot of brands to, to really enter China without making that significant investment and needing the FSDA, the CIQ, those types of approvals. Um, but cross-border is, is also meant to be that, that the last bastion of, of really authentic, genuine products because you're buying it from the source. So in theory, when you're buying a cross-border product um, from the UK, it's coming direct from that brand. But cross-borders become a little bit unwieldy. And, and if you look at something like cosmetics, it's the number one category on, on cross-border. Um, it's a way to skirt around some of the rules, such as no animal testing and things. So a lot of, a lot of great um, cosmetics brands don't want to forego their values and they want to come into China without testing on animals. So they go through cross-border. But Singles Day, how much is the biggest e-commerce day? I'm sure many of you have heard of November 11th. Um, there's 40% of all cosmetics sold were fake, according to a Chinese survey uh, from a pretty legit uh, government organization. So there is a real lack of trust in, in the way things are in China. Do you want to click? And as a result, um, Chinese do significantly more research on significantly more platforms than, than their peers. So this is a chart. This is not our research. This is from Con and Wolf. They, they looked at consumers in the UK, USA, and China. So the top being the light pink being the UK, and then uh, China being the dark red down the bottom. If you look at the blue on the end of the China, that is the additional research that Chinese consumers did across every channel. So there, every single channel, Chinese did more research. 
Uh, and that just and that's reflected in, in the research we do. They're not just going on a website or going on a social media account thinking, yeah, that looks great and buying it. They're doing an awful lot of research before a lot of it comes down to trust, particularly for foreign brands and foreign categories that they're not as familiar with. They're, um, they're doing an awful lot of research before they buy. And there's all these weird, wacky uh, channels that, that are quite different from those Western digital channels, which obviously digital here is, is huge, um, but they have quite different characteristics and quite different sets of uh, what really works and what doesn't. And, and in many cases, you can do significantly more on a lot of these Chinese platforms um, than you can do on their Western equivalents. So, Mark, um, so Mark just, just from a question on that. Point, um, so again, mm -hmm. if you're a you know if you're a gigantic big multinational, you, you can manage uh, a lot of your your channels and manage your messaging and have you know a PR sort of structure to protect that mm -hmm. when people are online. If you're a smaller company and you're approaching the market, uh, what what sort of smart quick things can you do? Like should you have a, a Chinese language part, you know, even just an introductory page on your own website, your .com or your .co.uk or do you, know, do you need other digital platforms? What are the simple first steps that companies should be thinking? Yeah, the quickest, that's, that's a really good question, David. The quickest win would be that website, the, particularly for cross-border. Most research will be done on those, those well-known platforms, the Tmall Globals, the, the JD Wells, those types of platforms, the, the Kaola, the, the Red Book. Uh, they, they are where they will go for most of their cross-border shopping for food and beverage. Uh, but in some cases, they will still research your website. So the smallest investment you can, or the easiest thing you can do, and, and typically a small investment, is really making sure you've got some of those Chinese pages. And it's not just about translating, and, and it's a cliche, but Google Translate is, is a big no-no. It doesn't look great at all. And, and, but it's not just about translating word for word. It's about localizing and making sure your messages are resonant and relevant to these consumers who are quite different needs. Payments are a big thing if, if you're using your own website and, and consumers love to pay on Alipay or WeChat Pay. Uh, mm. It's everywhere here. It's, it's mobile payments are bigger than anywhere else in the world. So those types of things are as, as a really kind of checklist for the basics it's about getting right. Uh, WeChat is, is, a, is a great tool as well. Um, it's just recently, the last couple of months, um, you can now set up a, a WeChat account as a foreign business. Um, we've got something on our website that, that, that goes through all how you do that on chinaskinny.com, but you can, you can set up a WeChat account. But again, WeChat is quite management intensive and, and most WeChat accounts, particularly those that are underinvested, don't get a huge amount of traffic to them. Um, so you really want to make it worthwhile and if you are going, it's worth doing it properly, but it is an investment, particularly for a small brand. So, yeah, to answer your question again, websites are quickest win. If you can be on those, uh, be on those, those cross-border platforms, they can be a great tool for both marketing and sales. And then some of those social channels, WeChat, there's some the new short videos um, can be really good as well. And then just using celebrities. So, have we got time just to talk about new retail? It's, it's something that is incredibly yeah, interesting happening in China. Uh, and if you look back a few years ago, there was a very successful entrepreneur in, in the western city of, of Chengdu. What he would do is he'd, he'd roll up his sleeves and he'd, he'd go into these really expensive apartment complexes and he'd go through people's trash. So he'd look through and he'd, he'd look at the products that they were using and buying and, and th obviously throwing out. And he, from there, he got a really good idea about what products consumers want in those neighborhoods. So he'd build a little convenience store right next to these expensive complexes and, and stock a lot of those products that he'd found in their rubbish. Fast forward a few years later, and you've got a company called Alibaba um, that realizes that China, they, they want to dominate the world and start with China. And they realize that selling particularly food and beverage online is never gonna, never gonna be, never gonna be everything. If they want to to rule the world or rule the retail space, they're gonna need, um, they're gonna need to be offline as well. Particularly products, food products, because people still like to see, hold, 
feel, see if it's fresh, see if it's the right color and stuff when they're buying a food product, which you just don't get online um, because it's just a photograph. So whilst food and beverage is one of the fastest growing categories in online in China, it is still only accounts for a little over 10% of all sales. Uh, so almost 90% 90, 90 of, of sales are still in these physical retail channels. So Alibaba thought, well, we're going to have to get into physical retail. And they, they started, which some of you may be aware of, the Hermas stores, which is this wacky, uh, very in, integrated, digitally integrated um, supermarkets. But what, what a lot of people go in and it's, it's a lovely experience and you can get all sorts of things while you're in there and, and you can get, they have dynamic pricing and lots of information and get on your smartphone and stuff. But what kind of powers these stores are, is much like the man that was going through the trash in Chengdu, you're getting Alibaba every time someone buys something online on their platforms, which accounts for about 80% of all e-commerce sales, they know where it's getting sent to. So they're starting to see this neighborhood buys lots of this stuff. This neighborhood buys lots of this stuff. And then they're also, they've got something called Alipay, which is their big um, payment system. And it has become the standard. If you go into a, department, a, a convenience store in China now, and you try and pull out cash, they'll look at you like you're an old fashioned weirdo. Everyone has got their phones out in the queue and they're all just paying with phones. And that's been an absolute boon for uh, Alibaba from the data point of view. So they've got all this data into where people are buying online, where they're buying offline, all sorts of other data from all of their assets, uh, from food delivery services to video, short video um, services and everything. And as a result, they have all this data into what people like to buy. And so their Hamas stores uh, much like in Chengdu, they're very specific to a certain neighborhood and they're very smart in the way they do it. So if you look at the average, or, or, sorry, an established Hermas store, it makes about four times more sales per square meter than a normal supermarket. So there's an awful lot of uh, smarts that have gone into it. And, and, you're starting, and also there's this ability to deliver. So if you don't want to have to carry your groceries home or if you don't even want to go to the grocery store, you can order it through the app. And 60% and of all Hermas sales now are through there. So you're seeing Alibaba, they've, they've bought a bunch of the big uh, big retail supermarket chains here from Artima, Orchan, uh, they've bought Suning, Fresh. There's an awful lot of retail, similarly with Tencent, who gets a lot of data from WeChat and from WeChat Pay. They've, uh, they're in bed with JD.com. Uh, they own 20% of it, and they've, uh, they've also launched their own Herma equivalent, uh, Seven Fresh. They are they're in bed with Walmart, Sam's Club, Carrefour, Yonghui. If you look at the top 10 supermarket chains in China, seven of them are very or either owned or a very close partnership with either Alibaba or Tencent. So you're starting to see this Herma technology rolled out to, and, and Alibaba's rolling it out to RT Mart. You're starting to see some of the very interesting things happening there. And, and I expect it will, it will grow out to um, more and more of these supermarket chains. It'll get to the point where if you're a supermarket chain without that data and without that integrated wacky stuff, it's gonna be very difficult to compete. And so you're starting, as a, as a food and beverage brand, some, Good to be aware of, particularly in the fresh category. Um, there's a lot of focus on fresh in these these categories. We're doing some work with McCain, um, Canadian frozen foods brand, and I was speaking to the Hermar guys, and I was saying, "Hey, I was just in your Hermar store, and, and I see there's a bunch of freezers in there. Um, what could you do you think there's any chance I could get some of these McCain products in in your freezers?" And he looks at me, and he's like. You know what? We're actually getting rid of our freezers, a lot of our freezers in in store now because products just aren't selling. And I scratch my head and I'm like, yeah, that totally makes sense. If if you look at and, and we were doing in-house research and we we're looking at people's freezers, people's freezers are actually quite small. And if you look at um, the Herma, you can get things delivered within 30 minutes. So if you were looking to something you would have traditionally frozen you can just order it on the app and, and even defrosting it in the microwave if that's what you do. 
you don't really have to do that anymore because you can get it delivered fresh from Humar. And, and fresh is obviously um, considered much healthier for Chinese consumers and, and it's just a better product all around. So those fresh, ready to cook type products that are obviously really popular in the UK are really starting to, uh, to take off here in China. And those types of things are well worth considering if you are looking into this, the opportunities for new retail. All right. Well, I think uh, we'll keep going because I'm conscious. Uh, maybe you want to. Yeah, well, that's, do a that's so I just, and, and we'll get a good note. To um, so just to sum up, Chinese consumers often see things quite different than we do. Hence the green versus the yellow for Australia. GDP growth has been driven by these millennials. Consumption accounted for 78.5 percent of GDP growth uh, for the first half of this year. Uh, it's where it's what's driving China's economy and it's been driven by these big spending millennials. They are living all over China and, and, and they, in each part of China they all have quite different needs and, and preferences and perceptions. Um, I think it's worth noting that their product needs are different from the West such as the dairy, the format sizes, the segmentation, it's all about me, I want it personalised for me rather than just generic. Uh, lack of trust means they do significant amounts of research before they buy. So they are looking across uh, European, UK news sites. They're talking to their, sh their friends that are students in the UK. Are these products actually legit? Are they good? Are people in the UK buying them, etc.? And there also there's this opportunity with new retail integrated online to offline. It's happening from both a retail standpoint but a marketing standpoint from all these different angles uh, there's some pretty exciting things happening in that space all right well thank you very much for that um uh just uh, i suppose we'll ask if anybody has any questions uh to type them in to there i have one here from john um are domestic brands making foreign style brands or is it still the import market for these products yeah there's significant number of Chinese brands have obviously got very local brand categories and products, but you're starting to see a significant amount of Chinese brands moving into categories that were traditionally dominated by uh, imported brands. I think a really good example is coffee. Uh, and Costa is, is pretty small here. Coca-Cola's obviously just bought it, so you're probably gonna see some more, but you look at the last, 10 years Starbucks has done incredibly well and they've really had no competitors in the market and they've been growing rapidly and expanding rapidly and in the last year you start to get these local competitors you may have heard of Luckin Coffee uh, which had been around for less than a year and it was worth over a billion dollars I think it was six months that had been around worth over a billion dollars they just they've really localized very well kept that kind of coffee uh, prestige, but they've, they've made it delivery and this new retail integration and things really good and they've done a really good job. There's a bunch of other coffee box where you create your own coffee uh, cafe and on WeChat and get all your friends to buy it, things like that. So coffee, which has traditionally been almost all foreign brands, has, has done a remarkable job, some of the local guys. And Starbucks actually, for the first time, their revenue dropped 2% last year. So you're seeing a lot of categories threatened okay. by domestic guys. Interesting. All right. Yeah, well, well yeah, I, I can't, can't, naturally we would follow that way. Uh, question from, from William. Interesting one, this one. Do Chinese companies have ambitions to export their F&B abroad? That's a good question. And you look at a company like Mangyo, uh, Big Dairy, one of the two big dairy brands here. They, uh, they have big aspirations to export abroad. Uh, I don't think you'll be seeing them in the shelves in the UK, but interestingly, the World Cup, uh, they were one of the sponsors of the World Cup. A lot of that is because there's so many Chinese back home watching it and they see their brand on TV in Russia and they think, wow, what a great international global brand. But they're looking at a lot of the Belt and Road type stuff. So a lot of those countries that are less, I guess, concerned about food safety perceptions from China a uh, 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 lower hanging fruit for them than, than those Western markets. They have much more established brands and much difficult to crack. But you're, you're getting a lot of ingredients. China is a net exporter of food and beverage, but most of it's that raw ingredients. Yeah. 
um, but you will see a few brands, but generally not in places like the UK. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, following on from your clear uh, Kiwi love of all things dairy, I've got a question here from Sandra. Uh, what about uh, trends in flavors? I mean, you talked about flavored milks and all of that kind of stuff. So any particular flavors? Yeah, it's interesting. That's a really good question, Sandra. We, uh, we often do analysis into flavors for a lot of different categories. And, and sometimes it can be quite seasonal. The Chinese are very... They have this this yin and yang and, and food balance and things. So the way they like to eat can be varied on whether it's hot or cold. But then there's also these wacky wacky things such as um, walnuts was a very popular flavour of milk a couple of years ago because walnuts look like brains, the shapes of brains. So people thought that walnut flavoured milk was great for brain development. They have all these weird things. Um, so we've toothpaste is a good example of a project we've just finished that, that we're looking, working with a natural toothpaste brand and they all these flavors that are really popular I, I've never heard of them there are a lot of TCM a lot of traditional Chinese medicine that are, that are really popular there's obviously the usual suspects the green teas uh, the ginseng all that type of stuff is, is obviously very popular so, so traditional it's worth considering sort of traditional Chinese flavors uh, if you're looking to enter that market, I mean, it's it's the big localization question, isn't it? Totally, and and I don't think for many SMEs it's really worth investing a huge amount in that new product development just yet. Mm -hmm. Stick to your mainstays, what you're best at, what you're known for. But then, as you evolve, you might, or as you grow, or, or get more ambitious, it's definitely worth considering some of those um, okay. those more localized flavors. All right, uh, one from Vicky here. Um, yeah, what, what are the hottest areas in the food and drink market? So there, are there anything, you know the way China's great for an old fad for six months. Are, yeah. there, are there any particular fatty ones at the minute? Um, the last 12 months, the funniest one's been the cream cheese tea. So that's absolutely huge here. Um, people lining up. Chinese don't like to queue up. They love everything instant gratification, but they're loving that cream cheese tea, which flies in the face of health. Uh, anything related to health is huge right now. It's it's the biggest category in food and beverage. It's it's the one that you really want to want to be on. Um, also, as I said before, fresh is is really big, and that's being driven by retail channels and and just this again perception around health and, and well being. All right. Um, so that'd be the biggest ones. There's all sorts of weird, wacky niche niches in different categories that are worth watching. It's a big enough market, I think, for there to be. Well, listen, Mark, thank you very much for your insights. Um, it's been fascinating this morning. I think uh, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, and just before we go, I uh, just want to draw your attention to some upcoming events, activities. Uh, bits and pieces. These should all be clickable. So if you're interested in agriculture, food and drink, this is one that I'm highlighting here is our sort of sector page, which will have an introduction of the colleagues. Antoinetta here in, in the UK is our sector lead. Uh, if you don't know her already, you certainly should. So you'll find some background bits and pieces there. We recently did a couple of food and beverage insights, which are on snack foods, on um, Ooh, there's three of them. Snack foods, breakfasts, and, and sort of fizzy drinks or something like that. I think those three. Um, so do feel free to have a click on those. They are free to members and a small charge to non-members. We have another webinar in this sector coming up on the 24th of October, a little bit ahead of FHC and some other uh, big food and beverage things happening in China. So exporting F&B to China, practical tips to make the most of the opportunities. You can click on register here. You'll also find it in our mailings on our website and all of those usual channels. Um, and then finally, I guess the SME Forum, uh, our sixth SME Forum will be happening near Heathrow, just for that sort of West London M3, M4 kind of corridor area. That will be on the 31st of October, a really, really excellent event for small and medium sized enterprises that are looking to enter or grow in the China market. For those of you who are in Shanghai during CIIE, I imagine the city will shut down for those couple of weeks. On the 8th of November, we will be holding the sixth China Outbound Conference. So that's one of our large flagship events in China, um, supporting outbound investment, Chinese investment uh, into the UK and uh, presenting lots of projects. So there's just a few bits and pieces, an awful lot going on in the food and drink sector with CBBC keeping our, our colleagues really busy. But it's, it's a really exciting time, I think, for that 
sector. So that pretty much wraps it up. As I said, thank you very much again to Mark. If you have any further questions, um, please get in touch. You'll receive an email in 24 hours, uh, an automatic one from the system that will link to um, the recording of this um, and, and, and sort of give you contact details, etc. So other than that, that's it from my side. So wish you all happy and successful China business. Thanks very much and have a great day. Bye now.